with the big machine, machines that can learn. Let's give him a big round. Kids here probably have become big kids too. And um, who were uh, here last time to rent the talk? I want to see. Oh, actually, not that many people. But um, I remember there was a kid um, who liked to raise his hand and answer my questions even though he never gave me the right answer. Who tried to you know, ask you not to raise it? <laughs> who was that? Because I really like that kid. <laughs> who was that? Who do we think? <laughs> Jeffrey. <laughs> but he was certainly one of my favorite kids. That's one of the things I remember from my last talk. But um, among those people who were here last time, did you remember what I talked about last time? At least the talking, of course, the content you may not remember, but what was the talking? Last time. Uh, you should be able to remember, right? <laughs> computational, linguistics. computational linguistics. That is uh, my primary area of research. Um, I am not an expert on machine learning, um, but I you know, um, have been learning a lot about machine learning because machine learning is a very powerful tool. It has been applied to many different areas, not only areas in computer science, but also, you know. Um, areas and other disciplines. And so I don't know how much you know about machine learning. Um, it's certainly possible that some of you know more about machine learning than me. And you realize that I you know, talk about something that does not make sense to you, then definitely you should you know, jump, yell, and correct me. Okay? I think that the first part of the talk is uh, kind of a general overview of machine learning. It's, uh, it's not that technical, um, but the second part of the talk may be a, a bit more technical, and so um, we'll see the, um, how well we can follow um, the talk. So um, let's start with a basic question. What is machine learning? So here's a quote taken from a um, professor um, of computer science at Cornell Med, who is currently you know, one of the leaders in the field of machine learning, Colby Cho. He defined machine learning um, as any computer algorithm that lets the system perform the task more effectively or more efficiently than before. I guess um, it's a very, very general high level introduction. Perhaps um, after reading this definition, you may not really have any idea of you know, what machine learning is because it sounds just like human learning. But let's take a look at another definition, also by a uh, former professor of. Um, um, computer science at Army Mellon, um, Herb Simon. He is uh, generally considered one of the four founders of artificial intelligence. He passed away um, 10 years ago, um, but um, you know, um, many of the um, AI researchers nowadays are you know, um, his former students. So let's see how he defines machine learning. He said machine learning denotes changes in the system that are adaptive in the sense that they enable the system to do the task or task drawn from the same population more efficiently and more effectively in the next time. And so I don't know, you know whether you realize there's really any big you know, difference between the two definitions. Maybe you change the or to an end, and maybe you know, we have this extra phrase from the same population. So um, I don't know, you know um, how you understand this phrase from the same population, but it doesn't mean that you, know, um, you can only uh, you know, then things that you know we have seen before. So, for instance, let's say you know you wanted to teach your kid um, how to distinguish you know, a boy from a girl, and so what you would do is you know you show you know your kid, okay, this is a girl, this is a boy, this is a girl, this is a boy, okay. And um, it doesn't mean that you know, if you ask him in the future whether you know somebody is a boy or a girl, um, he should be able to tell you even if you know he hadn't seen the boy or the girl before. From the same population doesn't mean that you have to have you know seen that same person before before you know you can you know, before he can learn whether or not that's order or no. In other words, now, uh, one important concept in machine learning is the ability 
to you know uh, perform in a situation which has never been encountered before. In other words, we have to be able to generalize from the things that you have seen. It's not that if I haven't seen this you know, bill before, then you know um, the, you, you will not expect the kids to you know, you know tell you that she's a bill. You should be able to you know make generalizations from the things that we have seen before. But what exactly do I mean by from the same population? What that really means is that well maybe you only show you know um, the kids uh, your kids you know, very important in your skills. But then maybe you should not expect your kids to be able to distinguish between Chinese boys and Chinese girls. Maybe there are sufficient differences you know, between these two groups of people. And so from the same population roughly means that you know, if you know you draw your you know um, cases from the same group, then you should be able to you know um, to make future predictions you know using you know using you know uh, uh, things drawn from the same group. But if you uh, try to you know, draw things from a different group, and you should not expect your kid to be able to, you know, make the correct judgment or predictions, you know, for things from a different group. Okay. So, um, since these two definitions um, don't really you know, tell us much about what exactly machine learning is, because, you know, it's just like human also in the same way. So, you know, what's the difference between machine learning and human learning? In fact, uh, Machine learning resembles human learning a lot, and so um, if you understand what we talk about in this slide, then you definitely you know, will be able to get the key points about machine learning. So let's take a look at this example in which um, we um, want to see how a kid can learn how to speak English, for instance. Okay. So um, how would a kid, you know, learn how to speak English? Well, um, that should be a learner. Um, typically, maybe you know, his, his mom or his dad. Who you know, speaks to him, and so you know, um, those English sentences that you know the mom or the dad um, um, speaks would be what we call examples. These are just you know, natural English sentences. But um, if you think about it, if you want the kid to learn you know, how to speak, you cannot you know, just present to the kid what we call you know, correct English sentences. Because if you know you, he never understands what is incorrect, how can he decide on whether something is correct and whether something is incorrect? What that means is that you know, we should not just present the correct examples to him, we should all also present incorrect examples to him. But in this particular scenario, uh, mom would rarely you know, talks about the things that are you know, grammatically incorrect. So where do we generate the, the incorrect sentences from? Well, in terms of that, in this case, you know, it would be the kid who generates these you know, incorrect sentences. And then the mom or the dad would tell the kid that this is incorrect. And that's where the kid can get feedback about you know, what is correct and what is incorrect. And only if the kid realizes that this is incorrect, then he will be able to distinguish between you know, correct sentences and incorrect sentences. Okay? And machine learning the same way. If you only present to the machine these so-called correct or positive um, examples, then the machine will not be able to learn the concept that you want them to learn. And um, why is learning possible? Because language, or in general, our world, you know, does not operate in a random manner. Um, we can learn language because you know, there are patterns in natural language. For instance, you know, we know that, let's say we have a sentence, I like the dog. We would not say something like "like I the dog" because we know that the verb, you know, the verb of the subject would not precede the subject. That those are the you know, rules of the you know, English language. And even though maybe you know, for a native speaker, we would you know, not start by learning the grammar for the language. We just you know um, consider examples of that language. Um, somehow, you know, this you know the kid internally when you know, he listens to these different examples, he would try to you know, generalize and somehow learn the underlying grammar, underlying you know, these examples. And so uh, it's, it's because of these rules or patterns, um, it's because of the statistical correlations, you know, um, between, for instance, the different words or even different <coughs> sort of speech and the words that enable you know, um, learning to occur. If everything is random, if any word can be followed by any other word, how can learning be possible? So it's because of the correlations in the things that we have in this world, not just language, but for instance, we know that you know, the table cannot move. 
We know that the sky is blue. There are other these rules that govern the world that's, and then that make it possible for us to distinguish things from each other. Okay? And same for machine learning. If there is no pattern in the data, what can you expect the machine to learn? So you know, it's because you know, things occur you know, um, in a non-random manner that enables you know, learning. Another thing that you know, I mentioned in the previous slide is you know, um, generalization. Um, after hearing you know, the mom speak these English sentences, um, you should expect the kid to be able to produce new sentences that he or she has not heard from the mom before. Why? Because what the kid is doing in the learning process is not just memorization, but he is able to you know, learn the online grammar, which he can then use to, you know, um, to, to, to create new sentences. That's what we mean by generalization. And same for machine learning, as I mentioned in the previous slide. You should not just you know, expect your kids to memorize or machine to memorize things. Okay. And finally, in the generalization process, you want to make mistakes. Just like when the kids utter new sentences, you know, there could be mistakes. And in you know, machine learning, the machine can also make mistakes. But you know, how can, I mean, the question is how can we design systems that can improve the accuracy you know, when we see that machine is making mistakes? That's one of the main points of machine learning. So here is you know, another task um, that also demonstrated the few points that we mentioned in the previous slide. So here are the task is you know, how can we teach a kid to distinguish dogs from cats? Well again, you know, in this case maybe the mom takes the kid you know, to different places and show you know, to the kid, okay, this is dog, this is a cat, this dog is a cat. And that's you know, where the feedback or the solution came. Okay. And again, you know, there are certain patterns or statistical correlations that enable learning to occur in this particular example. So for instance, um, maybe uh, whenever the kid you know, um, sees a dog, the dog barks. And so the kids somehow learn that, okay, dogs will bark. But with cats bark, unless the, the kid also sees that uh, the dog bark, uh, the cat barks, you know, he would not, he would realize that, okay, one way to distinguish between dogs and cats would be that the dog bark and cats do not bark. And so he would be able to derive from what we call the patterns or attributes that are associated with, you know, one of the concepts, but not the other. And that's you know, why learning is possible. Okay. And again, you know, we would expect kids to generalize. Um, in this case, you know, when you, you know, show the kid new dogs and new cats, you should still be able to tell you that okay, this is a dog, this is a cat. It's not that you, know, you can only tell you, you know, what a dog and what a cat for only those dogs and cats and cats. Now, um, what I mentioned here is how to generalize depends on representative content. So this is something that I mentioned before. If you only show that the kid dogs and cats in Texas, you may you should not expect him to be able to you know um, correctly distinguish uh, between dogs and cats coming from Alaska. Maybe those you know, dogs and cats are quite different from the dogs and cats in Texas, and that's what we mean by representativeness. You know, it depends on you know, how broad you want you know, the concept to be. If you want the, you know, the kid to learn a broader you know, class of concept, you should select the examples in such a way that represents that concept you want the kid to learn um, well. Okay. And finally, in this case, of course, the kids can also make mistakes. And you know, all these points also apply to the machine learning. Machine learning learns from examples, derive patterns from the data. You should expect you know, the machine after learning to be able to generalize and you can make mistakes. Okay. Now, the question is why do we care about machine learning? Why do we want to study machine learning? Well, then, we know who Mark Peter is. He's the chair of the computer science department here. Uh, I think that a few years ago, I remember he said something like machine learning is the future of computer science. Um, and that kind of tells you know, how his view on machine learning is really something that he considered important. And in fact, he said that he went to um, a Department chain meeting, I guess, you know, there are common chairs that are coming from different schools in this nation, and they have a meeting discussing what are the important issues or topics that computer scientists should focus on. And I think that you know, he just came back from that meeting three or four weeks ago. And those computer you know, science department chairs talk about you know, identifying maybe three or four things that they consider very important for computer science. One of the things is machine learning. And so um, they, and then they, of course, you know, ask a lot of you know, computer scientists to demonstrate their work and you know, illustrate how important machine learning would be in the field. Yeah. Well, here's another quote taken from some web page. Uh, I think that, again, I read from some web page maybe a couple of years ago 
saying that um, machine learning is the most important of the 12 IT fields that employers can say no to. And so um, many people believe that their routine you know, is you know, hard the top. You should know that you don't know, get a job, but in fact, machine learning you know, has grown importance. And so let's take a look at you know, what exactly that web page you know, has in it. As companies work to use software such as spam filtering and fraud detection applications that see patterns in jumbo size data sets, some observers are seeing a rapid increase in the need for people with machine learning knowledge or the ability to design and develop algorithms that can use to improve computers' performance. And so in this case, you know, what's the relevance of data sets? You know, those data sets contain the examples that machine needs in order you know, to be able. And it's not just the case for Google. There are lots of applications that have big data sciences, which creates a fundamental problem of how to organize data. And that's why the machine learning is something from the hot topic. I remember that when I was doing undergrad back in the 90s, I think that machine learning was still something. You know, at the you know, graduate school level, you know, um, we have courses you know, um, in grad school, but not at undergrad level. I think that uh, one of the first undergrad machine learning courses was offered around you know, the year 2000. Because at that point, you know, we start to see the you know, um, data um, that is getting bigger and bigger. And we realize that you know, if you want to you know, um, identify interesting patterns from you know, those big data, it is not possible for a human to manually go through you know, each example in the data in order to identify interesting patterns or and try to learn something. And that's why you know um, this is becoming you know, more important because you know we can see that people are producing lots and lots of data every day, including you, know, you could probably you know write a lot of emails or maybe if you have a Twitter account, you you know write a lot of tweets. Those also consider the data because people you know, do data mining machine learning from that kind of social media data. So, yes. And um, the reason why we want to study machine learning is you know. Um, they allow us to develop computer systems with new capabilities. So for instance, um, we can use machine learning to develop systems that are too difficult or impossible to construct there. And I think one of the more successful applications um, in this case would be the speech recognizer. Well, with speech recognizer, what do you want? You take in you know, speech data. You want to you know, um, transcribe the data so that you get, you, know, you want to understand what words are being mentioned in the speech data. And if you think about how we can possibly use a speech recognizer, well, you can say that, okay, this song corresponds to this film theme or this word. And so you can potentially write you know, a lot of rules in order to do this kind of transcription. But you can you know, imagine that it's not easy because, first of all, you, know, you may have to write a large number of rules. And second, maybe if you have to decide how to order your rules, maybe you should apply this rule first before that rule because sometimes you, know, you may have. You can apply more than one way at the same time to so how you order you know, your rules in such a way that it gives you the you know, best result. And so people realize that it's hard to maintain you know, a database of handwritten rules. And so they started to apply the machine learning to use speech recognizer. And again, this is one of the earlier you know, um, commercial applications of machine learning. Mm -hmm. okay. And other application would be you know, developing systems that can automatically adapt and customize themselves to the needs of the individual users. I don't know whether you know that you know, um, in your browser, Google may have already you know, used machine learning to try to you know, predict you know, what you expect or what you want when you type in something. So, for instance, if you just, just type in a word like um, vintage, it has many different meanings. So, which meaning is the one? That you know what? When it tries to apply machine learning, what it actually does is um, it, it tries to see you know which link you click, and then from the links you click, it tries to infer you know, which meaning of vintage you typically prefer. So the next time when you type in the same word, it will try to show those links that things you prefer you know in the first page or in the first few pages. And so it's trying to do personalization using machine learning. Okay, so you, know, you are actually consuming this opportunity. And, and um, another you know, um, uh, application would be to discover knowledge and patterns in databases. Well, um, a lot of you know, um, department stores like um, uh, 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 Walmart, for instance, um, they collect a lot of data from customers. When you apply you know, for their you know, Walmart card, they actually you have to fill out some information about yourself, like you know, your your, your age, your gender, occupation, things like that. And this, you know, during that process, they collect 
information about when every time you use your car to buy stuff, they report your purchase intent. So why do we care about this? Because they want to, you know, based on you know, what they can, you know, your, your personal intent, maybe they can develop certain marketing strategies that can help you know, increase their profits. And so um, what they did is they collect a large amount of data from people and then they asked these you know, machine learning researchers to try to you know, find interesting patterns you know, in this data. And I remember I attended one talk maybe a few years ago um, where he talked about you know, the rules that he can find from such data. And I think one of the rules that he mentioned is um, that his automatic machine learning algorithm you know, returned to him is that 99 percent of the housewives are females. And so maybe this rule doesn't, you know, um, it isn't that useful to us, but you know, um, this is an automated system. And it's trying to find statistical correlations. And again, that's what machine learning is about. And so even though maybe this particular rule may not be useful to you, um, it, you know, uh, this is you know, what machine learning is. And you know, it helps us you know, at least um, derive you know, conclusions or rules then the human can inspect, and then maybe the human can decide, okay, this is the correct rule, this rule is useful, and I can you know, give it to Walmart, and they can decide what to do about this observation. Okay. So um, I mentioned a few applications already, and you can see a lot more applications in the next few slides, so I'll just, just do a slide for a minute. But why do you want to study machine learning now? Actually, I mentioned this a um, few minutes ago. Uh, first of all, um, the initial algorithm is theory. Um, already in place, and so you know, for an undergrad or even for you, you know, people you know, um, studying high school, you can actually you know, play with you know, machine learning algorithms and on, on some whatever data set we have. Because you know, these algorithms are not for general purpose algorithms; they're not developed for specific tasks. Although you can improve you know, the performance on a particular task by developing algorithms that are specific for certain tasks, but many of these machine learning algorithms are general purpose off the shelf, and they are actually you know, the implementations are available on the web. And I actually show you a website where you can you know, get these machine learning algorithms from. And so you can just download from those websites and then try to you know, run them on some data set to see what kind of results that you know, these algorithms give you. And um, there is, of course, a growing amount of you know, online data. That's why there is a need for us to do automatic extraction of useful information from you know, this large amount of data that we have. And machines are good at doing one day work. As you can imagine, you know, we like calculators because you know, we don't do the kind of things that calculators do for us. Um, calculators would not make mistakes, humans make mistakes. So um, if we have a large amount of data, the calculations done by these machine learning algorithms to find that correlations, so they will not make mistakes, but maybe humans would make mistakes. And in fact, you know, now these machine learning algorithms have been shown to be able to you know, discover interesting patterns from the data that you know, even the experts would be surprised at. So even humans may not be able to you know, discover all the interesting things from the data that machines can get used to. Okay. And finally, we now have the computational power, and this is important. In fact, you know, many of the problems, not just in machine learning, but in artificial intelligence in general, is because you know, it's, it's too big. If you can you know, think about a problem like playing chess, why is playing chess so you know, difficult? Because there are just so many possible moves and points in the you know, chess game. And so, um, if you can, you know, um, so how, how can you play well if you think about it? Well, if you can think, you know, look ahead, if you look ahead, you know, 10 steps to 20 steps, if your, your mind is so powerful, then you will be a much better player than the other. Uh, and so, um, if, for instance, if you want to develop a chess program, you want it to play well, if you have very powerful hardware that allows you to, you know, look ahead 10 steps, 20 steps in a very short amount of time, then your chess program will be very powerful. But, you know, um, but of course, the limitation is that, you know, um, there is this hardware limitation. There's how you know, a limit on how fast a program is certain. That's why you know, the chess program you know, it is difficult to develop. But we can imagine that maybe 10 years, 20 years from now, even if we use the same method that people have, maybe the hardware that we have at the time is sufficiently good that you know, we can you know, do a much better at you know, um, playing chess you know, using machine. Okay. And so, because of the computational power that we have nowadays, you know, the type of data sets that people are interested in machine learning you know, um, uh, 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 can be you know, um, dealt with by machines. And so, this is a reason for people to spend time on machine learning. Okay. 
And um, even though I have mentioned the number of machine learning applications to me, there are actually a lot more applications in different areas, um, not just you know, um, areas of computer science, but also you know, other disciplines like mathematics and, and, um, and astronomy. So let's take a look at you know, some examples from information understanding. So if you take a look at the first sentence there, can I have a piece of cake? So of course that is not the right word. Piece is the correct you know, word for that sentence. And um, how do you, you know, choose the right word to use, for instance, if you know, someone, maybe a kid, um, who you know, is trying to learn English, you know, cannot distinguish between these two words, and um, you have to write machine learning programs to try to select the you know, words that are kind of confusing um, to, 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 to learn in English. Okay. Another problem um, that um, people tackle a lot in um, natural language is what we call word sentences in English. Um, of course, the word can have multiple meanings. You know, how do you know what the correct meaning of a particular word is in a particular context? So, in, you know, this sentence, Nissan car and truck plant it. So, plant has a certain meaning here, but in this sentence, if I like it, it plant and it can be So, you can see that plant in the second sentence refers to the, the biological sense of plant. And so, you know, um, people have again function and try to, you know, um, deal with this what we call the first sentence. Again, it's a problem of deciding what is the correct sense of the word in a particular you know, sentence. Well, another problem that people have applied machine learning to in uh, net language processing is what we call prepositional phrase attachment. I don't know whether you have heard of this problem before. If not, let's take a look at this sentence. Um, buy a car with a steering wheel. Um, so here we have this prepositional phrase with a steering wheel. Um, is this phrase attached to buy or car? Which one is it you know, more practical or faster? Buy or, or car? Car. Car, okay. What if you replace this phrase with um, buy a car with his money? Then in this case, you know, this, um, with his money would be modified by this. So this is the prepositional phrase attachment problem. You know, is this, this prepositional phrase attaching to you know, the noun or the words? Okay. And finally, I guess you know, there is this problem from the that many of you should be familiar with. Let's take a look at the sentence in case of that. The dog missed the kid, he was taken to the vet. In this case, you can imagine that he would refer to, to what? The dog. The dog. But if you replace you know, a vet to a hospital, then you know, he would refer to the kid. And so again, you can follow the context is um, the pronoun would refer to different things. Again, you might apply machine learning to solve this kind of problem. To you know, some success, so they have not been able to punish them to completely solve these problems, but they realize that you know, um, machine learning you know, um, gives give them better accuracy. Then you, know, if you try to write a lot of rules to say, okay, if we have this context, then you know, we should reserve solve this program to you know, this you know, database. And so, rule based methods you know, seem to underperform machine learning methods for many of the problems in the natural language processing. Another um, problem, I guess, is Vision problems. For us, it's easy to say that you know, how many categories of things that we, we have in this picture. We have animals, we have shoes, I guess we have um, veggies, and maybe we have you know, some other classes. But we can easily tell you know, um, how many categories of objects we have. But for a machine, you know, it may not be an easy task. And so this is the problem of machine learning. Um, uh, uh, computer efficient. You want to be able to, um, in this case, I guess, um, um, try to you know, identify the class of each object so that you will know, um, be able to tell you, okay, this is a shoe, this is an animal, or this is something. So, this is what we call an object of uh, recognition. Okay. And this is another problem in computer vision. Um, this is what we call face recognition. Given the picture, you want to be able to identify the, um, the, the, where the face is. And I think that we will have to apply some of these face recognition. Algorithms to identify the you know, um, terrorists, and so I think that um, the, I think the U.S. government has actually put a lot of money in face recognition research because of you know, the potential application to you know, anti terrorism activities. Okay. Um, in terms of applications to the you know, bioinformatics, um, in this case, you can you know, use machine learning to um, predict you know, different diseases. So, for instance, maybe in this case, one to predict how likely a person is to have pneumonia. And so um, what this is, is I don't want you to know what this is, this is what we call a neural network. And so in a neural network, you give you know, a lot of inputs to it. So in this case, we have three possible attributes taken you know, um, 
um, uh, about the person you want to you know, create. Um, so, for instance, you want to know the person's age, gender, blood pressure, etc. And then you take some attributes after he um, was admitted to the hospital, um, like you know, a number of different you know, blood tests. So, you feed all these different you know, attributes about that person into what we call neural net, and then um, and then the neural net will be able to tell you after protein learning um, how likely the person is going to have. There are no more applications. Uh, one is recognizing handwriting. So um, in this particular application, um, the US Postal Service is actually you know, using um, machine learning to read the zip code. And so you know, in this case, um, the prediction would be the digits that the person has written on the letter. And um, people have managed to train machine learning algorithms that can predict at um, accuracy levels of 99.5%, so it's not a perfect accuracy. I don't know how they use those letters, whose digits are misrecognized, but no, um, in this case, it's one of the um, commercial applications of machine learning. Okay. And I guess we have talked about um, speech recognition already. Um, so this is um, this is famous example, how to recognize speech. So this is the sentence that produced by the speech recognizer. The original sentence, I guess, is how to recognize speech. <laughs> but this is a sentence produced by red answer, so you can see that you uh, can certainly make the difference. Okay. Um, more applications, um, you can use machine learning to find ideal customers. Um, people have applied to credit card approval, so you know, credit company tries to see you know, whether you, know, you should issue you know, this card to a certain customer. And I guess um, people have applied you know, both human and machine learning to this task, and they realize that. Uh, uh, machine learning actually give better judgments, about 70% um, than humans. So they actually ask, of course, the human to examine after the fact you know, whether this is a customer or not. And they realize the machine learning actually help make the correct decision, you know, in more cases than, you know, okay. And an application would be to find the best job for, um, the best person for the job. So in this case, um, the application is telephone to machine expansion. So now they can use machine learning and learn rules to design which job. Uh, Technician to dispatch and it's helped them save ten million dollars per year. And finally, you know, um, we mentioned about the application regarding predicting purchase behaviors. Okay. And there are other applications we talked about them. You can actually you know, um, train a stem for this yourself. Again, you know, this is one of the applications that you probably use every day. Um, whenever you know um, you mark one of your emails as spam, Google actually help you know retrain a classifier for you. Um, to learn what you consider you know, spam or what you consider not spam. And this, you know, you can imagine this kind of personalized because what you consider spam, spam may not you know, be what other people consider spam. Maybe Viagra is considered spam for yourself, but not for some other people. And that's why you know, Google thinks that you know, it's a good idea to it's a personalized spam. And recommendation systems, I guess you already know what it is. When you go to, for instance, a um, website like Amazon, you know, whenever you, you know, look at a product, then you're trying to recommend the products for you. But again, you know, it's kind of personalized because you know, you're trying to remem remember which products you have seen and what the clicks that they have so that you can learn you know, what you typically like to see. Okay? Or what you typically like to see based on you know, other people's experience as well. Maybe in that case, it's not as personalized as you know, what we have in Stanford. Journal. But no, no, this is the kind of system that you are using every day and they are being uh, using machine learning. Okay. Now, um, there are these applications, but I don't know, you know how compelling we think the applications that we have talked about so far. So let's take a look at some more compelling applications of machine learning. So I guess now, I don't know whether the kids know this or not, I guess the parents probably have heard of this back in 1997. Um, the IBM chess machine beats the world um, chess champion. So this is the, the, the world chess champion playing against the IBM machine. At that time, this uh, Russian um, chess master called Kasparov. And he played against this uh, IBM machine that you know, they called the blue back in 1997. And they actually had quite a number of games. And at that time, they played six games in a month of day. And in the first game, Kasparov won. In the second game, he blew one. In the third game, there is a draw. Fourth game, there is a draw. Fifth game, draw. Sixth game, he blew one. And so, overall, he blew one the game. And so, let's take a look at what people think about the blue. So, here are some comments. So, so here is another comment. Um, IBM stock price got up until the day he blew the test. So, this is what um, the 
Russian chess um, player, Kasparov, uh, who was the leader by the people I could feel, I could smell a new kind of intelligence across the table. Let's see what another person said. Um, saying you do doesn't really think about chess is like saying an airplane doesn't really fly because it does not land the space. And so there are a lot of criticism saying that, okay, even though you have a machine that, you know, um, once again, it doesn't mean that you know, he thinks like a human or he can play chess, but you know, um, this person says that, you know, he, he, he tries to offer his you know, opinion about what he thinks he can do. And um, this is a, a comment made regarding um, the second game of the six games played between the chess master and Deep Blue. So in the second game, Deep Blue took an early lead. Um, the chess master resigned, and it turned out that he could have forced a draw by the control um, check. And this person said that this was real chess, this was a game any chess master or grandmaster would have in front of. And this person went to a member of the Deep Blue team. And so uh, I can actually hire you know, not just you know, the technicians or the computer scientists. They actually also hired lots of chess masters to help them develop this chess program to make it good at that time. And so this was you know, a common day by one of the chess masters in the deep blue team. Okay. Here is another common day by another chess master who is not part of the deep blue team. So let's take a look at what he says. As deep blue goes deeper and deeper into a position, it displays elements of the strategy <coughs> of the game. Somewhere out there, mere tactics translate into strategy. This is the closest thing I have ever seen to computer intelligence. It's a very weird form of intelligence, but you can feel it, you can smell it, smell it, it feels like a thing to me. Okay? And so this again is you know, another opinion about EP. So um, in my opinion, there are two major factors that contribute to EP's success. One is, as I mentioned before, the advances in hardware usage. Because you know, um, with better hardware, you can search deeper and deeper into the game. You can you know, look ahead you know, much better than if you have you know, poor hardware. So, um, in fact, you know, the two, Deep Blue and Kasparov, played back in 1995, two years before Deep Blue won the chess class. So at that time, in 1995, Deep Blue actually lost the game. And in those two years, you know, IBM actually improved their hardware. That's one of the main factors that allowed Deep Blue to win the game. And another reason why people can win games is because of the access in machine learning. In particular, they design what we call a better stack, stacking evaluation function. So if you don't know what the evaluation function is, well, it's nothing but something that allows us to evaluate board fault. So given a particular board, you want to see how good it is from deep use point. So for instance, let's say you're at a particular point in the game, and there are many moves you know, that you can choose from. And each move will lead to a different board state. If you can tell which board is good from your point of view, you know which is the best move. And this evaluation function tells the you know, you know, how you should make moves when you are at a particular point in the game. Okay? But you can you know, imagine that designing this evaluation function is not an easy task. Why is it not easy? Well, there are many things that you have to consider. For instance, maybe you want to add up all the values of Pieces as they as weighted by the points on each piece. For instance, a queen may have a large weight, a pawn may have a small weight, and so on and so forth. You want to see the you know, uh, material value of each piece, and it's, it, that you can use that to evaluate how good board is from your perspective. But you know, there are other factors like isolated pawns of that, how well protected is your king, how much maneuverability you have. You have control of the center of the board, strategies can change as the game. So, how can you, you know, factor everything into a single number that tells you how good the board position is? Not an easy task at all. And also, this is expensive because you have to consider so many factors. Um, it's going to take time to return this number to you. And you know that you, know, you cannot wait for 10 minutes before you can respond to your opponent. And so, um, the faster you, know, you can. You know, Think and search and compute, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the better your know, chess program is going to be. And because of, you know, um, I think machine learning in this case helps combine different sources of information and they assign weight to each component that indicates the board. So, for instance, in this case, we have different bullets. You can imagine each you know, bullet as representing some of the components. Um, how important is you know, this factor as opposed to this factor? And so if you know, machine learning uh, factors that this is more important, they will assign a higher weight to this. So then when you combine these factors, 
this will play a you know a, 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 a more important role in you know the, the, the battle of the body function. Okay. And so um, this is the way of shoot on this movie uh, in the design of people that eventually want to make. And of course another um, uh, thing that I again did to you know, make the public you know excited is um, this was and so it comes to Germany last year. So I guess you already know what it is. This is a question answering system. But you know, how is it different from the chess program you do that they developed in 1997? Well, chess is a finite and mentally well defined social space. Um, it has a limited number of moves and states and is grounded in explicit unambiguous mechanism. So there's a you know, very small set of rules that define what moves are legal, what moves are not legal. But you know, the jeopardy problem or task is a lot more challenging because you have to do with gender language, which is ambiguous. Um, textual and it's it's grounded only in human cognition, but it's not that best use. And moreover, seemingly there's an infinite number of ways to express the same thing. So there are a lot of paraphrases. So how can you, you know, determine that you know, this you know, sentence is actually means the same thing as that sentence? Again, this is an easy task for human, but very challenging for okay. And in fact, um, according to the IBM scientists, the art art for Rossman is finding and justifying the correct answer in the first spot, computing confidence that is right when doing it fast enough to compete on Jeopardy. If you remember, when no um, wasn't returned an answer no, um, to you, it returns a few answers and then there's confidence associated with the answer if you remember that. And so uh, in this case, um, uh, this question where was Einstein born? And from this you know, um, sentence that it expressed out of some document in this database, it has to be able to infer that you know, all of them is the correct answer. Okay. And so if you're given this question, well, you rent this. And from this particular sentence, I guess, you have to be able to infer that this actually refers to G. So you can imagine that, you know, it's not an easy problem at all. And, you know, what role does machine learning play in the development of Boston? Well, um, people use machine learning to determine at which classes of evidence are important. So, for instance, um, Watson discovers that Jeopardy categories are only weak indicators of the answer type. I don't know whether you know what this means or not, but if you look at you know, this particular example, you know what I mean. So in this case, um, what um, the um, scientists discover using machine learning is that it is not really useful to know which category a particular question belongs to. So for instance, it's not you know, that useful to know, you know uh, whether this question belongs to the author's category. It's not useful you know, to know this question belongs to the U.S. citizens' categories before you know, being able to do well. In other words, you know, um, the machine learning algorithm tells, you know, um, tells Watson that you should not forget about these you know, answer categories because you can do better without these answer categories. And that may be the reason why, you know, um, Watson returns to Toronto when you know, the question is about you know, the U.S. city. I don't know what you remember that question. And so uh, just because machine learning thinks that it's actually better to forget about you know, certain indicators such as you know, the, 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 the answer type. Okay. And uh, through learning, Watson values and selects confidence with an eyes and projection. So you can imagine that you know, uh, one of the things that distinguishes this task from chess is that you need a lot of human knowledge. And um, Boston actually has a huge database. Um, it's just a lot of books inside the database. And of course, you know, given so much information, it's not possible that all of this information would be relevant or useful uh, for playing Jeopardy. And so um, people use machine learning to select or filter out those you know, um, books and it's a Wikipedia that they consider not that useful. Um, I think Jeopardy and retain only those information that you could use because there is just not enough time for you know wasn't search over and over more than you know um, billions of books in Wikipedia that it has this database. And um, work in machine learning, as you can see, you know, based on what we have talked about so far, makes you saw probably against the states in the algebra because again. If you remember, you know, what machine learning is trying to do is it's trying to discover statistical correlations among you know, different attributes of your data. That's why probably gets like this design. It's related to psychology, neurobiology, and linguistics because machine learning may benefit from knowing how humans learn. So you know, and, and humans and, and machine learning may also inform human learning. And so the two views may benefit from each other. That's why I said that they're related. 
it's personal memory. And as we have seen, you know, um, there are numerous applications of machine learning to properties <coughs> going on in computer science. Okay. And um, there are you know, three major machine learning paradigms. Um, maybe let me you know, talk about these paradigms and how they differ. Okay, so let's take a look at these three major paradigms and how they differ from each other. So most, almost all, I would say, most machine learning algorithms <coughs> in the time of the web belong to one of the these three categories. So what is what we call supervised learning? What exactly is that? Well, um, in supervised learning, um, the teacher provides feedback to the learner. So the mom provides feedback to the kid if she discovers that the kid is making mistakes. So you know, this feedback can be provided in the form of exactly. So for instance, you know, again, when the mom shows the kid that this is a dog, the cat is talking to that. This is feedback. This is what we call supervised learning information. And that's what happened in supervised learning. And in supervised learning, the learning time is very well defined. What that means is that you can actually design methods to measure how, the, whether the kids successfully learn the concept or the machine successfully learn, learn the concept. So for instance, how do you know how good your kid has been able to you know, distinguish between dogs and cats? Well, you just take the kid to other places and, sh and ask him, you know, is this a dog, is this a cat, is this a dog, is a cat? You can you know, measure you know, how accurate the kid has in terms of you know, distinguishing between dogs and cats. You can you know, do this because the task, the learning task in this case is very well defined. We have a very specific goal for learning task that we want the kid to learn. So that's what we mean by supervised learning. In contrast to supervised learning, you know, we have what we call unsupervised learning, which is a second major um, paradigm of machine learning. In this case, the learning task is not well defined. So let me you know, tell you why the learning task is not well defined. So for instance, well, um, NASA collects a lot of data from you know, space every day, and these data keeps, you know, gets sent to NASA through you know, these devices. And so we end up with a bunch of things like this. And what that means is that there is a lot of data being produced you know, every day, and there is a large amount of data. But NASA doesn't really know what they want to do with this data. They just want to see whether there is interesting information that they can extract from the data. In this case, there is no specific task that they want to learn from the data. They just want to see but if there is some useful information that they can get out of the data. Okay? And in this case, it's what we unsupervised because there is no teacher involved in the learning process. Why is there no teacher? Because we don't even know what we want to learn. And so you know, the teacher will not be useful in this case. But it is considered a strong point of unsupervised learning because you know, it is sometimes you know, not cheap to hire a teacher. And so if you can learn something useful without a teacher, that is sometimes considered a strong point. Okay, so that's something that people like about unsupervised learning, even though you know, the kind of problems that we interest in in supervised learning and unsupervised learning are kind of different from each other. Okay. And there is, I guess, another application of unsupervised learning. In this case, um, we call this predicting protein functions. What are we trying to do here? Well, of course, we're trying to predict protein functions. But how do we predict protein functions? Well, people believe that um, if two proteins have similar three-dimensional structures, then they have similar biological properties and similar functions. And so if we can you know, try to you know, compare the proteins and then determine how similar they are, then we will be able to you know, determine what the function of the protein is. What that means is that if you have a new protein, a protein that you have never seen before, but you can you know, see that the structure is very similar to something that you have seen before, then you can use what you know about existing proteins to help you predict the function of new proteins. Okay? And in this case, you, know, you don't need any you know, supervisory information. There's no teacher involved in the process. Even though we have to be able to have a program, what you can consider in a similar, what you consider not. Because otherwise, you, know, you cannot you know, determine you know, you know, which uh, family the new protein belongs to. Okay. And there's this last category um, of our machine learning called reinforcement learning. Well, in this case, it's like supervised learning in the sense that there is a well defined learning task. So, for instance, in this case, you want to um, balance the pole. You don't want an apple at the top of the pole to fall off. Do you need a teacher to teach you how to balance the pole? Or not? Not really, because how can you learn this case without a teacher? Trial and error, right? I mean, after trying enough times, you start to learn you know, the tricks and strategies that you can use you know, to balance the goal. And so, in this case, there's no teacher that's providing any you know, feedback to you, but there is what we call implicit delayed feedback to 
process. So where is this delay to end? Well, at some point, the flow is going to stop. And you know that you know we have made some mistake at some point you know, in the process. But you don't know which action that you took caused the flow to fall eventually. So um, this is what we call delay feedback because you know, when you make a mistake, it does not cause the flow to fall immediately. But the feedback is kind of delayed because only after the flow fell that you realize that you made the mistake at some point. Okay? And so this is kind of like you know, this is either supervised learning or unsupervised learning. It's like supervised learning in the sense that it has a well defined learning task. And it is like unsupervised learning in the sense that you know, no teacher is involved in the learning process. Okay? And there's another you know, very successful application of reinforcement learning. I don't know, you know who has seen the game that they are. Okay. So I guess you, know, you may also know how to play this game. But um, the, the successful application of reinforcement learning in this case refers to the fact that you can actually train a neural network by having the you know, computer play against itself 1.5 million you know, times, and then it will be able to learn how to play the game and can you know, um, play against well class of as well. And so that's kind of you know, a very interesting application of reinforcement learning. Because in this case, just by playing against itself, you can develop a world class. You know, um, um, chess program that can play well against you know, um, chess. Okay. So I guess maybe it's time for us to take a break, and then after that, we may talk about something slightly more technical. Okay.